Okay, so yesterday we we looked at the concept of a uh, uh, two by two game, the game tree, and how to analyze the game tree in a very simple kind of game. And we learned a strategy for analyzing these kind of games where one player moves after another, and by moves after, it's not so much the time dimension, but that one player can look back and see what the other player has done. Okay, and the key idea there was to take the perspective of looking at it from the end of the game, not starting from the beginning. Now, in a two-by-two two game, it doesn't really matter too much. You can sort of sometimes work from the beginning. But as games get a little more complicated, which they will, uh, uh, what you want to do when you're analyzing is sort of think, well, it's kind of difficult to know what the first person is going to do because that's going to depend on what the second person is going to do. And what the second person is going to do is going to depend on what the third person is going to do. And maybe the first guy comes back in here, and so he's going to be thinking about all this other stuff down there. Well, yes. But if you go to the end of the game and try to work out what you think is going to happen at the end and work backwards, okay? So you've got a principle, kind of think forward and reason back. Um, now, practically, this is a really good, a really good idea. When you, say you have to write an essay, okay? Or you're giving a presentation. Sometimes the, the best way to start is to think about how you're going to end. You know, what is the last thing I want to say in a presentation that I want these people to go away with? And force yourself to think that. Like, just one sentence. What is it you want to conclude? Okay? And then work backwards, and you can kind of build up to that. Okay? So that's just sort of part of the general idea. It's a, it's a strategic concept, but particularly it's really important because when you're looking forward, you're going to be looking forward not just from your own perspective, but from the perspective of other players in the, in the, in the game. Okay? So uh, we have this idea of look forward, reason back, and we introduce a concept called rollback, R-O-L-L-V-A-C-K, rollback reasoning. And the idea is you start at the back and you roll back like this, okay? You're folding backwards. Sometimes, you know, for instance, research or mathematics is called backward induction, but for us it's just rollback reasoning and it's the common sense idea, sort of look before you leap, okay? Uh, or just, you know, at least look one step ahead. Sometimes one step ahead is more than enough, okay? More complex situations, we've got to look at several steps in ahead, but let's, um, uh, we're going to go back and just look at what we did yesterday. Uh, then I, I, I want to spend some time on interpreting the game tree. Now, we're going to introduce a concept called a strategy. We're going to spend some time talking about what a strategy is. And this is an important concept because ultimately in game theory, we want to predict the strategies that people will choose in the complex kinds of games that they uh, interact with. And we're going to build it up by looking at some very short, small, stylized kind of games. Okay? So, but we want to understand the concept of, of strategy, how to think about strategies, how to compute strategies. And if you think this is just an exercise, there will always be a question on the exam, you know, uh, identify the strategies and count them in a simple game. There's some good questions at the end of Chapter 3 for you to try. And generally, about half the class will have a little difficulty doing that. Okay. We'll uh, work through some of those ideas today. Uh, and then what we're going to do is, after we think about strategies, uh, we're going to stop and go back to the stop-go game, which has, by the way, another name called the centipede game, C-E-N-T-I-P-E-D-E. -E -E. You know, a centipede is like a little insect-like creature with these little balls and all these little feet kind of like this and a big, long sort of chain. Well, that, it's like think of a caterpillar, okay? So centipede, uh, this, this is a version of the centipede game. And the centipede game is uh, uh, kind of an interesting concept. The reason that it's called the centipede game, well, we'll see when we draw the game tree. Okay. Now, um, then after we do that, we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about the payoffs in this simple game. Then next week, uh, what I want to do is, uh, we're still in sequential games, reading in Chapter 3. But I want to spend some time applying these ideas of uh, look forward and reasoning back. And I picked out two chapters from a book called Information Rules by Hal Varian and, and Carl Shapiro. It's kind of an old book, old in the sense it's 10 years old, but it's, it's modern because it's timeless. And it's about the, the network economy, the information age, digital stuff, you know, MP3s, computers, uh, the Internet. Um, just, it's a fantastic book. Very easy to read, very interesting. And there are two chapters there on what's called lock-in. Okay? And so what we're going to do is uh, uh, talk a little bit about the idea of lock-in, how to manage lock-in, to sort of figure out what it is as a consumer in the information economy or as a seller in the information economy, get around kind of lock-in, 
how to manage it, okay, uh, strategically. So that's what we're going to do probably next Tuesday and the, or next Monday. And the next Tuesday, we'll extend these simple sequential games by adding a few more players, adding a few more things they can do. We'll play for some more chocolate bars. We'll up the stakes a little bit now, okay? I might even bring some money. We're, I know we're going to have a game that's got 10 chocolate bars. So be on your diet this week, okay, because somebody's a few people are going to get 10 chocolate bars, maybe. That's, that's what the stake is. And um, uh, I might even come up with $10 to play for, okay? So that's, that's for, for next week. This again, sequential games. After that, we turn into simultaneous games. Now, uh, yesterday, this isn't uh, on your handout with all the little squiggles and stuff like that. What we had was uh, a simple two-by-two two game. Now, uh, the game starts off with the red player deciding to invest or not invest. The blue player is going to enter or not enter if the red player does invest, or it can enter or not enter if the, blue, if the red player doesn't invest. And the idea of the blue player being over here to the right as opposed to over to the left, let me get the hand here so it would be easy to see, the blue player being over to the right as opposed to the left is we think of the order of play moving in this direction, from left to right. So the red player, when they're moving, they're the first mover, they can't see what the blue player is going to do. But the blue player, they're the second mover, and they can look back and see what the red player is going to do. Okay? So we have a, a um, uh, blue player moving first, uh, red player moving first, blue player moving second. We then sort of tried to analyze the game by looking at the payoffs. And we color-coded the payoffs because each player is going to concentrate on their own payoffs. Okay? Again, a little later in the class, we'll talk about what it means to think about your own payoffs. But the idea is that these are rational, intelligent players. They're playing a game. They have some goals or something at stake. They could be really selfish, self-interested people, or they could be altruistic people. Okay? Whatever they are, they've got some, some, uh, uh, some goals or purposes. And we, we identify these goals and purposes with numbers. And the numbers are kind of a rank order of preference. You know, one was bad, four is good, and two and three are kind of in between, with higher numbers meaning better okay, for that person. And we saw when we looked at the payoffs that uh, when we come to the outcome of the game here or the outcome of the game there, both players regarded the, uh, rank them identically okay, as third highest in their, in their ranking or as worst in their ranking. But when we got to these two outcomes here, there's a conflict of interest. Okay? That's what we describe as a conflict of interest. They rank the different outcomes in different ways. Blue player prefers to be at this node because a 4 is bigger than 2, and the red player prefers to be at this node because their red 4 is bigger than their red 2. Okay? So that's kind of the structure of the game. Then we, then we did a concept called pruning. We tried to look at just one little portion of the end part of the game, working from the end of the game, going to the end and moving backwards. And we figured out that the blue player wouldn't want to choose to enter because he gets a higher payoff if he doesn't enter if he gets to choose there. And similarly, if we look at this little game here, if we put a circle around that one, it's really just a decision for the blue player. And that uh, simple decision situation, a four is better than a two, the higher number, more preferred alternative. So the rational thing to do is enter or not enter. So we pruned or cut out these branches. Now, in actuality, the options are there for these players. They could do things that are irrational, okay? But because of our theory, these little squiggles that we're putting in there, we're saying, we don't expect those to happen. Who's we? Well, any rational person looking at this game, the red player included and the blue player included and us as theorists included, we're sort of thinking, well, okay, we don't expect this to happen, we don't expect that to happen, so what should the red player expect to happen? Well, the red sh player should expect if he invests, for this not to happen, enter not to happen, so this one should happen if he invests. Okay? Um, if he doesn't invest, again, we don't expect a not entry, a not enter decision. The red player doesn't control that decision. The blue player does control it. He could decide not to enter, but the rational thing for him to do is enter, so we expect him to enter. Given that, the red player's choice is really between investing and getting a not enter and a three, or not investing and getting an enter by the blue or two, three is more than two, so we prune this guy here. The red player would rather uh, invest and not enter than have to not invest and have the blue player enter and get the two. Now, the red player would really like it if you could get the four, but he doesn't control the outcome of the game. The blue player is the one who gets to decide whether the red player decides to not invest. The blue player gets to decide whether they're going to enter or not enter and determine you know, whether the red player is going to get a four or two. And that's the idea of strategic interaction, okay? of strategic interde interdependence. Is 
you're making a choice, somebody else makes a choice, and that choice influences you. Okay, here's an example. I set an exam, okay? I set a really hard exam. You get 10% on the exam. Not so good for you, right? Unfortunately, I did that about two or three years ago, not in this class, but in the econ theory class. And uh, basically, I walked in, I said to students, it's not, I mean, you guys, if you look at these raw marks, there was uh, 90% of the class got 11% or less. I felt very embarrassed. I mean, it was a great exam. I thought it was really interesting. Great, great question one, great question two, great question three, great question four, great question five, except it took them half an hour to read each question and try to figure out what was answered. These are the smartest people in the class. You could see their kind of writing and then uh, move on to the next question, you know. So it was my fault. I set too hard a, an, uh, an exam. But see, so what I did affected their interest, right? So that's all we're, we're kind of seeing here at this this point down here. The, the red player would like to get the big red four, but he doesn't choose it. The other guy gets to choose, okay? Now, uh, so then we, we figured out, well, what would we predict to happen in this game, assuming rational, intelligent players, or anything could happen with people who are inexperienced or not too rational or not thinking about the game or going to sleep or not interested or who have different payoffs, and we'll see how we can modify the payoffs later on. But still, we use the theory to predict what's going to happen, okay? We expect the red player to invest. We move along this path, and the blue player to not enter, and that is called the path of play. It's the rollback path of play because it's, it's the one we've, we've figured out for a, uh, using this rollback line of reasoning. Another path of play would be to not invest or to enter. And if you, if you think of a bigger game, you can sort of think of a history of play as you kind of go along, okay? And there's all kinds of histories of play, and it gets quite complicated when you get lots of people and lots of things they can do. The rollback payoffs are what, the outcome that we predict from the rollback path of play, okay? Now, there's another concept called the rollback strategy, which we haven't introduced, but we're going to come back to, okay? The path of play just says this is what we think will happen. Now, it turns out for a strategy, we not only want to think about what happened, but what would have happened if other things had happened in the game. And so a, a, a strategy for a player is going to be a kind of a specification of what they do in all the circumstances they get themselves in. And the stop-go game in lecture one, where I made the people write down, you know, we had a little list, uh, and I kind of got them, I said, well, if you red player, well, if you get there, what will you do? And if you get there, what will you do? And if you get there, what will you do? Okay? And vice for the blue player. So they were trying to, obviously, trying to get them to write down what they would do if they got further on in the game. A lot of the times, we didn't get even past round one in the game. Okay? So the strategy is kind of redundant. That is, there's a lot of possible actions or contingent actions built into the notion of a strategy. So that's what we're going to um, um, develop just from our simple game tree. Okay. So I, on the handout, what I try and do is when, the, when we've got sort of complicated graphs, I'll give you at least a portion of the graph uh, so you don't have to sketch everything down. Again, if you have two colors, it's helpful because you know you, you get a chance to distinguish between the red player and the blue player, um, and their and their payoffs a little more easily, a little easier. So what we want to do is try to identify on the game tree and in a way that will help us later on a strategy for a player. So the definition, a strategy for a player is a complete specification of all the things they can do in the circumstances they find themselves in. Okay, That's the definition. Let's see how it works out. Now, um, supposing I look at the red player. The red player finds himself in one circumstance in the game, okay, or one situation. Okay, now in this case, the situation is going to be a specific node. They've only got one move: they invest or not invest. Okay. After the other player enters or not enters, they don't have any choices. They don't get a pricing decision. They don't get to cut back on their investments or make up. You know, there's not there's no continuation of the game. They get one. They're in one situation. So they, their strategies here coincide with their actions. Okay. Possibly they could invest. Possibly they could not invest. So there's two strategies for the red player. Let's look at it for the blue player. The blue player finds themselves in a, could find themselves in a situation in the game at B1, or they could find themselves in a situation at B2. So a strategy, there are two situations in the game where the player could find themselves. Okay? If the red player invests, they will only, the blue player will find themselves up here, but 
they could have ended up down here if the red player had done something else. Okay? Supposing I highlight what they could do in situation at node B1 and at node B2, and they do the same thing. They enter. Okay, so the way we would say that in language, we would say, well, it doesn't matter what the other guy does, I'm always going to enter. Okay? So that's the strategy. And the strategy says, uh, in all the situations I find myself in this game, I'm going to not enter. Now, down in this little box, what I did is uh, I've just highlighted as a column what the player will do at node B1 and what they will no do at node B2. Okay. Well, see, we don't have to write this as a column. We can write it as a list, a horizontal list, too. But the idea is to identify the strategy as a list. Okay. Now, let's have a look at another strategy. Supposing the strategy of the red player is, well, I'll, at B1, I'll keep entering if I get there. But if I don't get there, I'll not enter. Okay? If I get at the other node, I'll not enter. Now, why would they do that? Don't worry about it. Just, it's like, what is the strategy? A possible strategy is to enter at node B1, not enter at B2. So here's another strategy list down here as a column. Okay. Well, what about if at node B1 they decided not to enter? What could they do at node B2? Well, they could enter. That's another strategy. And similarly, the fourth and last strategy is if they decide not to enter at both nodes, Isolate those two down there. Okay, so though you could sort of think about it, there's only two decisions for this guy, like I'm going to enter or not enter. Because there's two situations that he has to make that choice in, the strategy, which specifies what he will do in all the situations he could find himself in, he's got four. Two times two is four. Right? Go with me there. So you, could, you can describe the strategies by list. You can count them by multiplying. Now, it also happens that 2 plus 2 is 4, okay? And when people go to count strategies, they sometimes add instead of multiplying. It, 2 plus 2 and 2 times 2 is 4, is, so you get the right answer here, but in other situations, you won't. So when in doubt, multiply, don't add, okay? Just remember that as a little heuristic. And we'll, but one idea of counting the number of strategies, the possible strategies a player could have uh, in a game. Uh, it's going to be important that you learn that multiplying and not adding, okay? Now, let's Supposing I take these columns, E and E, E and not E, oh, sorry, to enter and not enter, to not enter and enter, to not enter and not enter, okay? And I write them horizontally, like, so this little pair of numbers here corresponds to that column of numbers there. This one here to that column there, that list there to that one there. Now, notice that when I write them as a list, there are two elements in the list. Why are there two? Because we, we need a placeholder for each situation, node B1 and node B2. Okay? So when, we're gonna, when we get in more complex games, like pe there's more players and they can do more things, basically when you're writing your list, you want to make sure how many situations in the game do they find themselves in, and then you're going to write a little list and make sure you've got a little placeholder for each of those situations. If they've got four situations, you'll have a, a list with four uh, elements in it, okay? If they have 20 situations they're in, then they'll have, they'll have a list with 20 situations. Now, you don't want to start, when they, even with people who have only two choices in two situations, you know, once you get it, uh, um, you increase the number of situations, the number of possible strategies goes up a, a lot. It gets a little complicated to even think about sometimes, but the general idea is that the, the strategy specify all the things that the player could do in the game in the situations they find themselves in. Okay? Now, Supposing we go back to the rollback path of play. Okay. Here's the rollback path of play. Here's the equilibrium. But to find the rollback strategies, we have to figure out what the player, blue player would have done down here. Okay. Now, we don't get down there because the, other, the red player decides to invest. But we know what the blue player would do because we've worked that out. Okay. Down at this end, we know that the, uh, the blue player would have entered at node B2, so we have a, this is their strategy, not enter at B1 and enter at B2. Now, this is a little difficult, okay? I mean, what we're saying is, um, for a strategy for the blue player, has to work with what he would do in all the situations he finds himself in, even if what we predict will happen, the guy isn't going to find himself in other situations. Okay? It's, 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 it's actually a deep concept. It's sort of, and, and it's important because... Why we, why we might want to know something about what this guy would do, even though we don't think he's ever going to get there, is that the reason we don't think he's ever going to get there is because we thought about what would happen if he did get there, and the red players thought about it and decided not to do it, because he's been able to figure out what the other guy would do if he got there. 
Okay. So the strategy idea builds in that kind of complexity of the, of, the, of the reasoning. There's enough information to work out what the player would have done in all these situations, so then you can figure out what you would do if you do, the thing, if you do other things and what, you, what might be your best course of action, okay. like a what-if scenario. Okay. So that's, I mean, the strategy concept is really, it's an interesting idea. It sounds like it's simple, oh, I just make a choice. Well, you do. But if you find yourself in an interactive situation, or interactive uh, game, strategic situation, you might have lots of different opportunities to make choices. And basically, the strategy says, well, now think about it. Plan ahead. Figure out what you would do in all the circumstances you find yourself in. Now, you might say, I'm too lazy. I don't want to do that. It takes too much trouble, you know? I mean, what are we going to do if Fountain sets a tough test? You know, what are we going to do if he sets an easy test? You know, what are we going to do if he gets sick? What are we going to do if we have a snowstorm? You know, what are we going to do if a library burns down? It's like, all these what ifs, it's getting too much to decide, right? I'm lazy. Okay, well, yeah, that's life. Uh, but when you're thinking strategically, it's important to figure out the what ifs, okay? Uh, I'm sorry to say that I think our, our political managers in this land dispute, uh, at least the guys now, the guys in the past, I think, thought about it, but the guys now didn't think about it. They don't think about the what ifs. They just sort of are kind of, I wouldn't say lazy, but there's a certain course of action for them that's nice and convenient, and uh, they didn't think about other course, the other course of actions that they had available because that would have made them have to think about what the other guy would have done if they had done other sorts of things, okay? And uh, again, we'll come back to that. You don't have to have a really complex game to understand the basics of this, uh, this uh, land grab game that's kind of going on. Okay? And the strategy concept would be very helpful. It's not just decisions. It's what decisions you might make in various circumstances or contingencies. That's kind of a cool word, okay? Um, contingency. C-O-N-T-I-N-G-E-N-C-Y. It's sort of contingency something's contingent when it depends on something else. Well, here, the blue player's choices depend on what the red player do. Why do they depend? Because the red player can see them. Okay. I, I, I had a fantastic time yesterday afternoon, because uh, I, I think this land stuff is, is really fascinating. And this guy, uh, Gottlieb, who's is a German, whose last name I can't pronounce, he's been, a, he's been an alpine guide down in Tekapo for the last 20 years. Okay. And... Uh, uh, we spent three hours together. I was just asking him all about this kind of this cool kind of stuff. More of which I'll tell you about as after we do the lock-in and the hold-up stuff. But one of them is fascinating. You see, I'm sort of sitting there thinking, you know, why didn't the crown just increase the rent on this land? And you know, I mean, if they want to use it for grazing sheep, fine. But if somebody else wants to build condos on it, you know, that's fine too. And so you have to pay the opportunity cost. You know, I mean, I might have a lease, but I can increase the rent. If this guy wants to graze his sheep and pay the prices that people are willing to pay on condos, I mean, who am I to complain? Okay? And, and, but, of course, you would think that nobody who's just grazing sheep is going to make the same kind of money as condominiums on Lake Tekapo, right? At least I wouldn't think so, especially since sections are selling for $350,000 a section, and there's 10 sections to a hectare, which we said is two big football fields, so that's $3.5 million to a hectare. You've got a few sheep running there that are making some merino wool. Well, I'm sure you make some money, but you don't make $3.5 million, okay? At least my guess is uh, you wouldn't. Um, and uh, so anyhow, so I'm asking about this, and he said, well, it's really interesting that you should mention that, because uh, about 10 years ago, I don't know if... Uh, have, Anybody put their hand up if they've been to Tekapo, just sort of have an idea? A number of people have driven there. If you haven't driven there, go and Google on Lake Tekapo. Te <laughs> Teka Whatever, okay? Tekapo. Um, it's fantastic. It's unbelievably beautiful. Just, you know, you come driving in, you've got this tussock, you know, and these mountains in front of you, you this unbelievably beautiful lake, and you, you sweep down to the township. And the township's a little bit, I'd like to see it improve a bit, but the, the scenery is, 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 is amazing. Well, on your way down in, there's a piece of land that's called the it's a, uh, Department of Conservation Scientific Reserve. It used to be leasehold land. How about that? Okay, we got a park. Okay, it used to be a leaseholder's land. Well, 10 years ago, he just said, I'm sorry, can't afford the rent. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't rent. In those days, that was before they brought in this, this uh, uh, rabbit virus. These guys brought in a, rabbit, a virus to kill the rabbits illegally um, about a decade ago. And... and so they had a, a levy on or tax on each of the farmers uh, to support the getting rid of the rabbits. This guy's land wasn't very productive. He couldn't make a profit. So he just well, said, no, I can't use my lease. You know, he's got a 33-year contract. You don't, want to be you don't want to be tied into a long-term contract if you don't have enough revenues to cover your costs. One of the costs was paying for the rabbit control. He couldn't do it, surrendered his lease. Okay. At the same time, he actually had a little bit of freehold land behind, beside it, which is the stuff that sells for $3.5 a hectare. 
Um, and, uh, uh, but we got this park. The Crown didn't have to pay anything for the park. All they did was charge the guy the price of, of trying to get rid of the rabbits. Okay? And so, when you know, you're a business person, you look at an input price, if it's too high, you know, you're not getting enough profits, usually you sort of exit. Well, that's just something like that. Okay? And so, uh, unfortunately, the Crown guys, our managers, don't seem to think that way. They don't sort of think, well, if I raise the rent to what alternative uses would be, I would expect these guys not to find it profitable to run their, their, their reno stations and their, their leases, they would exit their leases. They don't do that. They subsidize the rent for the farmers, and they have for a long time. Okay. Um, that was yesterday. It was, a good, it was a really interesting day. I picked up lots of, lots of interesting information. Scary stuff, but interesting. Now, uh, what I'd like you to do, just for a little practice, when we're talking about strategies, is take this little stylized game, and <clears throat> there are two players. I've added a third move for the blue player at node B2. Now, just identify, just take a piece of paper in a couple of minutes and figure out what the strategies are for the blue player. I won't ask you about the ones for the red player because they're the same as they were before. The red player only finds himself in one situation they can go up or down. What are the strategies for the blue player? Try and make a list of what those strategies would be and then how many would be in that list. Talk with your neighbor if you like. Don't worry about it. It's, uh, I was going to say we're not playing for the farm, but that's too much of a pun for Tuesday, 12 o'clock. You got any idea what I was asking? You could make a list, like a, you could make a column list, or you could make a, a horizontal list. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. What was your name? Megan, okay. Megan is asking, do I have to make a list like we did, you know, with a little column? Yeah, I'd like you to make a list of the either horizontal or column. I prefer horizontal myself because it doesn't take up so much space in the page, but you can do column if you like. Or you could do words. You getting anywhere? Keep going. Well, think about it. What, how many situations um, does the blue player find himself in? How many situations? How many nodes? Not how many branches. How many nodes? Two. two. Okay. So they got. <clears throat> what we're going to need is a list that's got two slots in it. Okay. And then we got to fill in the the different slots. Okay. Yeah. That's right. So one way you can get started is figuring out, well, what would they do at, what could they do at B1? They can go left, okay, so put a left there. And then go back down to no B2 and figure out what they could do. Okay, okay, got it? Okay. Okay, I'm just kind of wandering around. I think some people, you're kind of getting it, some people are getting the idea. It's, um, it turns out that there are six, um, strategies for the blue player. And the idea here is to sort of think, well, like, sorry, what was your name up there, the guy with the baseball hat was? Jan was saying, oh, do they have, just, do I need an extra column here? Do they have five, does he have five strategies? Well, oh no, I actually asked the question, how many situations does the guy find himself in? Well, the blue guy finds that he has, if you count the blue branches, there's five of them. That's adding two plus three, right? But if you multiply, go two times three, you'll get six. And that's, so you say, oh, five or six, well, you don't add. So the first thing is that you're going to multiply. And then the idea here is that the situations are the nodes, not the branches. Okay? So you have two situations, so we need a little list that's got two slots in it. And we have to fill in what, those, what the possibilities are for those slots. So um, the way I work it is I sort of think, well, if I start at B1 and I fill in the one of the slots with the left, like I've done down here, then on the other slots I can put in a left. If I can move my cursor, a middle, 
and a right. Okay? So there's one thing they can do up there, and for that one thing, there's three other things they can do, which gives me three different strategies, which are, okay, this one here, always go left. Sorry. Give the arrow. This one here is always go left. This one here, go left at B1, but go middle at B2. This one here is go left at, at B1, but go right at B2. Okay? With me there? Let's try the next one. I, I didn't have to fill in the first slot with an L. I could have filled it in with an R. So that's what I did here. I could have gone right up at B1. And then what could I do at B2? Well, I can do left, middle, or right. So I put in three little letters there. Left, middle, right. Okay? An idea? So when you're identifying the strategies out of a game tree, now this is, I mean, this is a theory kind of idea. You've got the game tree, you, got the, you can sort of see the nodes that the player's going to be in, the situations that are in, and you've got to figure out what are the possibilities for what they could do at those different nodes, those different situations. So you count the situations, make a little list, keep enough slots for the number of situations. Okay? And there's your number of strategies. You happy with that? Anybody got any questions you want to ask about that, that sort of logic behind that, counting, identifying the strategies? Okay, let's try a little harder one now, okay? <laughs> Believe me, if you can do this, this is going to get you another five points on the exam, okay? Uh, uh, or, or I don't know how much it'll be worth. There will be, will be a question on identifying the strategies and counting the strategies in a simple game. I mean, part of the... It turns out these little game trees are actually very useful. Just stylized little things for keeping track of stuff in your thinking about strategic interaction. So, uh, you know, we're going to play a little bit with the diagrams. They're kind of simple, but I'd like you to be able to read them and, and, and play with them. Okay, so that's why we're doing this. So, this is a little different game. This kind of says, uh, we now have some more situations for the red player, right? How many situations does the red player have? How many situations does up here? What's it look like? How many situations, how many nodes are, are little red nodes are there there? You're counting seven, so you've got, oh, good. what's your name? Kevin. Kevin. Kevin's thinking seven, okay? Now, what you've got to just, if you count seven, he's going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, what Kevin is doing is counting the branches, not the nodes. Okay, there's only three nodes, and there are, and in the in the graph, there's seven branches. Okay, now the, what a situation is a is a place where you're going to make a decision. Okay, it's not what you will actually do. It, the situation is the place you make decisions. So there's three situations, Kevin, at R1, at R2, and at R3. Is that okay? Not the seven that you're that you're adding up there. Um, so red points itself in three situations. We need a list with three slots, one for each situation, okay, to find out all the possible strategies. Okay, so all the possible strategies are a specific, complete specification. So we want a whole big, lots of lists. Now, how many are we going to have? Actually, maybe you guys try to answer this. Just without identifying them, how many would you have? How'd you get 12? Yeah, I'm, you guys hear that back there? I don't think you didn't, eh? Okay. Okay, what was your name? Okay, Tom. Tom said 12, and he's right. Okay, and the reason, the first reason that he's right is you multiply, okay? There's three situations. There's two at the first one, R1. There's two at the second one, R2. And there's three at the third one. So two times two times three is 12. Right? So there's 12 situations. Now we have to try and identify them. You can count them or you can identify them. So let's have a, let's have a, see if we can actually identify them. The, just remember the kind of rule. Once you, you know that there are three situations, then you figure out, well, how many things could he do with this situation? Two. How many things could he do with that situation? Two. How many things could he do with this situation? Three. So I multiply them all together to get the total number of situations. Now, look at, for some people who have done a little bit of stats or things like this, it might come natural. Probably not, because it took me about my whole undergraduate career before I understood this counting stuff. But it's re and we don't want to get into all the mechanics of counting. I just want you to, for, 
little simpler games get an appreciation for how many strategies there can be available because there are many situations people will find themselves in and many things they can do in each of those situations. And all of those minis times minis go together to often to make there's a lot of complexity here about what people could do in a game, okay? And then we want to figure out, well, what do we predict they will do, okay? So uh, let's start, and this is the way I started here, is I need a, I need a list that's got three slots, and I'm going to fill the first slot, which is associated with what they do at R1, with the up, U for up, okay? With me there? Now, then I've got to figure out what to do with the second, the next slots. Well, let me fill in the second slot. Well, the second slot is what they're going to do at R2, so let's put an L there. And let's put an L down here. And let's put an L down there. Now, you see why I chose three in a second, because what I want to do is fill the third slot with an A, then a B, and then a C. Okay, so I go A, B, C. I could have filled in that second slot a different way. I could have put an R down here rather than an L. Yeah? Okay, what was your name? Nathaniel, good question. How do you end up at R3 if you go up at R1? Impossible, right? In this game, it's absolutely, totally impossible. doesn't matter. The strategy says, what's the complete specification of all the things you would do? What's the complete specification of all the things you do in all the situations you find yourself in? So, though by choosing R1, to go up at R1, so if we fill in all the U's up here, we're thinking of red strategies. You know, he doesn't really have to even think about what's going on down here, right? I mean, because he's chosen R1 up there. Well, he might not have to think about it, but the other guy might want to think about it, okay? Because the other guy doesn't know what he's going to do. The other guy's trying to figure out, well, if he did play down, and I, and I do play uh, something at B2, I might get to this point here. I want to know what he's going to do there. I mean, I've got to think about what he's going to do. So the strategy fills in that possibility. It says, okay, it, there... If the red player plays the strategy here, uh, we, the red player doesn't have to worry about thinking about that, but the other guy might have to. So that, and the strategy is something each of the players can think about. What are all the things they could do in all the situations they find themselves in? Okay? Is that okay? And if, if, you, if I commit to you, or at least giving you a little bit of rationale? Okay. Just, I mean, what you want to think about is it's perfectly correct what Nathaniel said. If you play up as a red player at R1, you are not going to get to R3. Okay. That's correct. But a little deeper idea is maybe somebody else is concerned that because they don't know that you're going to play that particular strategy. They don't know what strategy. They're just trying to figure out stuff. Okay, and so they might have to think about what you would do if you got in that circumstance. And that's what the, the complete list of strategies will say. There's all kinds of things you could do. Okay, that's that's, that's the idea of the strategy. And you may not be interested, in it, but the other guy may need to be interested in it to figure out what you're going to do and then what he's going to do. So, what I'll do is I'll just plonk these guys in here. Remember, this is just saying what I would do up at node R, I'm uh, sorry, R2. And then down here, I, I could do A or B or C if I ever got there, which I'm not going to get there because I'm playing up here. But I, the strategy just says, what would you do in all the circumstances you find yourself in, okay? So, I'll put A, B, here and then, if and then I I still have only done the first no the first slot by putting it up. I can put the second second slot by putting it down, okay. And then uh, if I get to down, I'm going to go to R3. But I also could have got up here to R2. So it's a similar thing like Nathaniel. Well, if you play down, you're never going to R2. True, never, I, but the strategy says what would you do in all the situations you find yourself in. So the idea is when, uh, if you like, another way to think about it is that. When players are thinking about their strategies, and they're thinking about the other players' strategies, they're going to be thinking about the kind of whole game about what, what if, what, what if we had gone down there, what would have happened, okay? And sometimes you have to go down these rabbit trails to figure out things that aren't, you don't really think are going to happen, but they might happen, okay? And if they did happen, what would I expect to happen? Because your choice may be able to influence whether that happens or not. Okay, so it's just a matter of kind of helping your thinking process by making that strategy complete. Though it, it has this little paradox built into it, is some strategies, you know, are going to involve actions which you control, which will will never involve. Uh, you're not going to make choices which the strategy says you might make if you ever got there, because you're never going to get there. 
But the other guy might be thinking about that. Okay. Okay. And now I'll let you guys fill in the last one. And now what I want to do is I want to give you a question. Let's see if um, uh, we take this idea that we, what we've been doing for the last about hour and a half is looking at a simple two by two game. Okay. So two players. They each can do two things. It's a sequential game in that one player moves first, the other guy moves second. Now, uh, then we looked at the idea of a game tree. We analyzed the game tree using rollback. We came up with a prediction, and we talked about the idea of identifying their strategies and counting them. Okay? So it's kind of a lot of stuff. Turn around and do that for the stop-go game. Now, I don't want to go through all the, the stuff we did about the stop-go game, but you remember the red player gets to move first, can go or stop, uh, and uh, if he decides to go, um, if he stops, then he gets one chocolate bar. Uh, if he decides to, to uh, go, then the blue player gets to have a choice, but now the pie is growing, it's two, okay? And the blue player can take the two, or he can give it back he can, by stopping, or he can give it by saying go, blah, 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 okay? So just try and sketch the, the game tree for this. Just do so, you know, I mean, again, you're not, this doesn't have to be a Picasso, you know, uh, or Leonardo type work of art, it's just, Try to use two colors if you can, your red first and blue second, and see if you can draw the game tree. I'll get it. I'll get it. Got it. Again, when I ask you these things, you're welcome to chat with your neighbor if they're a friend and if you get some advice on what's going on or work on it together, I don't mind at all. It's just, you know, just trying to get your head around the idea uh, of um, here's the game. Can you draw the game tree and analyze the game using our rollback reasoning uh, and then count and list each player's strategy? It's looking good. No, it's looking good. Okay, so we got go and stop. Okay, but he, oh, when the blue player goes go and st if the blue player goes go and stop, you don't really need anything out there, do you? Because the game's over. Okay, so when you just well, the <coughs> right, right. okay, the the when you're drawing the game tree. We think of there's an order of play, okay? So the red player gets to move first. He can go or stop. Then the blue player gets to move. He can go or stop. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying to think of this as a line. Forget about this stuff. This turns out to be the, a list of the strategies. I'm asking you to just draw the game tree, okay? So, so think about the logic in the game tree is that if the, if the game stops, the red player doesn't get a choice anymore. Okay? If, if it stops at that note. But it, he does get a choice if the guy says go. Go and stop, okay? Okay, okay and so you cross that one. You're good. It, it's, it, that's great what, what you've done. I think the, the thing, and then the same thing here. If, if the red player, if the red, yeah, exactly. Okay. What's your name? Rose. Rose. Thanks, Rose. Okay. Look, we've got a couple minutes. Let me just show you. Uh, 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 Rose had a, had a great, um, I wish we had, you know, some kind of little video camera so that you could, you could see this, um, uh, what people are doing. I mean, 
it's really important you do this in class rather than wait for the exam. You know, when you think, oh, I'm doing this, doing this. But if you do it, well, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. You know, it's just easy to make a, like, it's not so much a mistake. It's just that I don't really understand what's going on. So let's have a, have a look at this, um, uh, this game tree, okay? And uh, obviously we're a little bit behind. We'll come back, you know. We make our own way in this class, right? We're, we're, there's chapters we're going to get through, but we've got a few, uh, uh, we've got a bit of time up our sleeves, so don't, don't fret about uh, stuff, okay? Now, the red player moves first. So I put a, a node with an A in it, and the red player has two course of actions, go or stop, okay? So uh, just thinking about the game, the red player gets to move first. Then a blue player gets to move if the red player says go. Otherwise, the game is over. Okay? So we, we put a node for the blue player next to this uh, arrow here, and the blue player can either say go or stop. Now, what Rose was doing is she was saying, oh, supposing the blue player says stop, the strategy for the red player might be go, go, stop. So maybe I should put an arrow down here, okay, or some tree or the branches and stuff like that. Well, no, if the, here it's just thinking, forget about the strategy list at the moment. Try and get the game tree, which is the order of play, okay? The, the, the blue player gets to observe what the red player's done. They've said go. Now the pie has come to two. I can grab it myself, and the other guy gets nothing, or I can give it back to the other guy, in which case they get a choice, Okay? Their choice is to grab it, or no, sorry, <laughs> grabbing it is to stop. They take the three for themselves, and, you get, and the blue player gets nothing, or they can give it back to the blue player, in which case the blue player gets another choice. Now, the blue player sitting here has looked back, and he's seen a red, he's seen a blue there, he's seen a series of goes up here, okay? And so he can say, oh, I'm going to stop and take it for myself, or I'm going to go and bring the game to the last round. And then at the last round... Though I said the red player could have a stop or go, there's a little ambiguity there. Basically, whether they say stop or go doesn't matter. They're going to get the same the payoff. They're going to get everything, okay, which is the five. So you can either just keep one branch out there, or you can make two if you like, because the payoffs are the same. So it, let's just think of that as the as a combination. Whatever move they make, it's, it, whether it's a go or stop, it's, it's one thing, okay? So that's the game tree. And you can see the initial centipede game, the initial centipede game was 100 of these things, okay? And so it looked like a little centipede when you drew it on a graph. That's where the name came from, the centipede game. If you look in the, in the text, there's a little discussion of the centipede game and the origin for it. It had to do with what's called the chain store paradox, where, you know, you get a, you get a, a what, like a uh, warehouse, you know, warehouse or a big fresh or these big chain stores, and they, they got chains all over the place and they have to decide you know if a competitor comes in and is going to fight me am I going to stay am I going to fight against them or not am I going to acquiesce and let them come in and it turns out that it's just like a centipede game uh, when you think about it usually the, it's not a good idea to have a price war because everybody's going to lose out and it's, it's better just let the guy come in okay and so you do that in all the markets and you think I never fight anybody else and, but where mostly other firms do they do actually um, you know try to uh, to uh, um, when other rivals come into certain markets, they try to fight them off. And that was the paradox. And they were using this, just a simple centipede game to try to understand wh where's the rationale of this? Yeah. And it was, so your name again was Tom. Tom said, okay, wouldn't you, we've got to get this guy to speak up. He's got good ideas. His voice is a little low. Okay. So, um, he said, well, wouldn't you just compare your costs and benefits to what your competitors and whether or not it's worthwhile? Exactly. Okay. And the, the point is that if you've got any chance of deterring somebody from coming in, which you might have, okay, and that was the thing is, well, in reality, people, we don't see the chain store, I mean, we don't see this, this thing we predict. We see people kind of, well, let's move out along the centipede game a little bit. And we'll see, there's a, uh, I've got some empirical results from a, a an experiment that was done. There's lots of experience, experiments in the centipede game because we're trying to figure out, you know, when people are paying for money, say up to 20, 30 bucks money, which is what this game is for. Uh, so if you're a student, you're playing this 10 times. At the end of the game, the, this payoff that we're going to look at was 30 bucks. If you got 30 bucks in each game, you would walk out for an hour experiment with 300 bucks. 
That's a lot of money. Okay. Matter of fact, you guys should go into Jeremy and and Maris and um, and Steve's uh, games because often you can make a lot of money. Uh, Glenn Harrison and I ran this belief elicitation experiment, and uh, we had to pay out seven hundred dollars to some people in this experiment. This is a U.S. dollar. I didn't have to pay it out. Glenn had to pay it out. He was really pissed off that he had to pay out this money, and that's because one of the bets we had was whether Rumsfeld would resign by the end of the year or not last year. We did this in the middle of the year, and nobody in the middle of the year thought there was any chance of Rumsfeld resigning. But, and so we gave some very favorable odds on these things, and what, he resigned. So we had to make these big payouts, okay? Uh, or a couple of big payouts like that. So he was, he was a little bit annoyed. And, but meanwhile, the people who are in the experiment are collecting big shekels, okay? Anyhow, when, with these experiments about the centipede game, you see some... Now, it's not strange behavior. People should, are people behaving irrationally? Well, not necessarily. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, so we'll come back. Uh, play around with analyzing the game. Okay, using the game tree, and then try and list all the strategies. We'll when we meet next Monday. We'll um, uh, we'll look at that.